recent updates in HIV and the program for it that is the National AIDS Control Program. As you now know that we are in the fourth phase of NACP. Now last year WHO had come up with the guidelines that uh, all the people who are HIV infected are in fact eligible to receive ART and therefore it should be provided to everyone irrespective of their CD4 count. And But as you know India is still a middle income country and therefore it is not possible for us to provide ART free of cost to everyone who is HIV positive. So what NACO has decided to do now is to keep the CD4 cutoff level of 500. So any HIV positive person who is having a CD4 count of 500 or less than 500 is considered as eligible for receiving ART. Similarly, we also go for the criterion of the HIV clinical staging. So any person who is in stage 1 or stage 2 of the HIV infection is generally one who is having mild amount of immunodeficiency. But once the person starts showing the symptoms of the stage 3 or the stage 4, and this is when really gets uh, burdened by a lot of opportunistic infections and this is the time when they really require a lot of ART. So all the people who are having any of the opportunistic infection belonging to stage 3 or stage 4 irrespective of the CD4 count are also eligible for receiving ART. So what does our Indian NACO criteria say? That any person who is having a CD4 count of 500 or less than that or any person who is having a stage 3 or stage 4 opportunistic infection is eligible for receiving ART. Now a special package which the NACO provides amongst the ART recipients is that of the PPTCT that is the prevention of the parent to child transmission of HIV. Now first of all remember that any pregnant woman in the first trimester itself she is supposed to get an HIV test done. Now when we talk of this HIV test it should be done as soon as possible in the pregnancy ideally in the first trimester. In fact, uh, it should be done before marriage itself or before conception at least. But even if it is done prior, it must be repeated in the first trimester of the pregnancy. Now, the test results could be two. It could be the positive or it could be the negative. If it is negative, well, that's good news. But suppose the patient is HIV positive, then what do we do? Now, in the earlier criterion that I talked of, we are saying that a CD4 count of 500 or less or a stage 3 or 4 opportunistic infections presence is considered as the eligibility criterion for ART, it has two important exceptions. The first one is pregnant women. Remember that all the pregnant women, irrespective of the CD4 count or the clinical staging, are eligible for receiving ART. Similarly, all the children who are less than 2 years of age, including infants, are also eligible for ART, irrespective of the CD4 count and the clinical staging. So now here in this scenario we are talking about a pregnant woman and she is uh, HIV positive and we start giving this ART as soon as possible. So it can be started in the first trimester itself. And when I say we give ART, this ART is a combination of the three antiretroviral drugs and this ART will continue lifelong. Now once the ART is started for the mother, the pregnancy is gone. Now the question is about the time of labor and delivery. Now we used to typically say that you know if you look at the antenatal period, the intranatal period and the postnatal period then it is the time of the labor and delivery when the risk of HIV transmission is the highest. We don't go for elective caesarean section just for the sake that she is HIV positive. But yes if she has an obstetric indication because of which there is a need for doing caesarean section then we will go ahead for that. Why is this so? This is so because you know once she is taking the triple antiretroviral drugs for almost 6 months of her pregnancy, the viral load comes down to such a low level that it does not make any substantial difference whether you are going for a caesarean section or you are going for a normal vaginal delivery because the caesarean section comes with its own inherent risk and we don't want the woman to unnecessarily go through that risk in her pregnancy and delivery. Now let's say the delivery is done and the baby is out, the mother of course will continue to remain on ART lifelong. But what about the baby? Now remember that uh, this is a baby which is born to an HIV positive mother and any child who is born to an HIV positive mother is considered as an HIV exposed infant. Now though the risk may be very low, the risk is still present, there may be some virus still in the body of this baby. So what do we do for that? We give post exposure profile access. Now this post-exposure profile access to the infant is given in the form of either Zydovudine or in the form of a more popular drug that is Nevirapine and it is given for a time period of 6 weeks. 
So after delivery, we'll be starting the infant for six weeks of zydovudine or six weeks of nevirapine. At the end of the six weeks, we go for the early infant diagnosis. Now this early infant diagnosis is done using a dried blood spot. It is an antigen based test because of course you cannot rely on the antibody based test so early in the life. Now if this test is positive, then remember that you have an infant who was exposed to the HIV and is now positive on the early infant diagnosis. So such infants need to be started on ART lifelong. And since this infant of course comes in that category of exceptions that where you don't require to look at the CD4 count or you need to, don't need to look at the clinical staging. So you'll be directly starting this infant on triple combination ART. But suppose luckily this infant is negative on the six week test. Then what do you do? Then ideally you're supposed to repeat the test at six months and then at 12 months. And finally at 18 months we'll be going for an antibody based test. In fact we'll be going for the triple antibody based test or the ELISA based test. And these are the confirmatory tests. If the infant tests negative on them, then there's no further need of testing. You can say that this infant has escaped getting infected. And with the current recommendations, we'll be very happy to know that more than 99% of the children will escape getting infected in spite of being born to an HIV positive mother. But then another important dilemma is whether the mother should go for breastfeeding or not in this HIV scenario. Now remember that it depends on the socioeconomic status to a great extent. So generally what we say is that if the mother comes from the good socioeconomic status, so generally if you look at the developed countries, then it is better to avoid breastfeeding the baby. Because through the breastfeeding, there is a 10% risk of getting HIV transmitted to the baby. So it's better to avoid that. But in a middle income country or a low income country, it is not a very feasible option. So you have to give the mother a choice. You have to counsel the mother in the antenatal period as to what she really wants. Now in the antenatal period, she'll be counseled on the breastfeeding option. So one option is that she can go for breastfeeding or she can avoid breastfeeding and go for the replacement feeding. Now if she uh, goes for the replacement feeding, then there is a criteria that she needs to fulfill and that is known as the AFAS criteria. Talking about the AFAS criteria, so AFAS means affordability for the replacement feeding, acceptability of the replacement feeding by the mother and her family, feasibility of doing the replacement feeding because it needs to be done almost eight times a day. The safety of the replacement feeding vis-a-vis -vis the option of breastfeeding. And lastly, the sustainability of this exercise for a period of six months. Because if a mother decides that she does not want to go for breastfeeding but wants to go for the replacement feeding as an option, then she will have to do exclusive replacement feeding for six months of time. And if she decides to go for the breastfeeding, then she will be doing the breastfeeding exclusively for six months of time. Well, the new guidelines say that at the end of the six months of exclusive breastfeeding, the breastfeeding should continue for another six months. That means the mother will be breastfeeding in total for a period of 12 months. And after 12 months, it should be gradually stopped. There should never be an abrupt cessation of breastfeeding. And in the age group of 7 to 12 months, the mother will be introducing the weaning foods, the supplementary or the complementary feeding would be started of the baby. Now, during this time of 7 to 12 months, the baby will be taking the mother's milk as well as the other foods. And therefore, there is a concern that this will lead to an increased risk of HIV transmission. Well, that is true that there is a very marginal increase in the risk of the HIV transmission if there is a mixed feeding beyond six months of age. But then that is very less as compared to the immunity which the child will develop because of the additional six months of breastfeeding. And therefore, the overall mortality rate of the child is going to decrease. So there is more benefit than the risk. That is why we recommend that the mother should breastfeed for one year even in the HIV settings. So this was about the breastfeeding and the prevention of the parent to child transmission guidelines in HIV. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment and subscribe.